So, okay, so let's talk about arterials. Arterials, right, are, are one of the ways we, we classify roads. The main categories are arterials, collectors, and local roads. And the arterials are the big roads that function like highways. Um, in Fairfax County, some of our principal arterials are routes 1 and 7 and 50 and 123 in the Fairfax County Parkway. Um, access is not as limited as it is on highways, but speeds are really high. Um, in more urban areas where arterials are surrounded by residential and commercial uses that attract pedestrians as, and, and um, people on bikes as well as cars, there are many potential conflicts between motorists and other users. Um, in Fairfax, many of our neighborhood streets don't connect, so cyclists right, are forced to be able to use the arterials to be able to make longer trips. Um, but what we know is that these are some of the most dangerous roads we have. The Smart Growth America in their recent report, Dangerous by Design, um, says that by far the most dangerous streets are the big, fast, wide streets designed for cars to run at expressway speeds through busy cities and towns. Transfer engineers call these streets arterials, but these car-focused streets are where people live and work and go to school and shop. Um, and in urban areas, they make up 15% of all roads, but a whopping 67% of pedestrian deaths occur on these roads. I actually got involved in FAB because I live just south of the Fairfax County Parkway. Um, and many of our community assets are just on the other side, or the elementary school my kids went to, our local Starbucks. Um, and one of the things that really frustrated me is the independence that we should have in our community so that our kids can get back and forth and that we can walk for a cup of coffee make the, the road crossing is so dangerous that we haven't been able to use it as well as we should, or I have to had to shepherd my kids across these roads. Um, and so it was one of the major reasons I got involved in some of the advocacy work that I'm doing. So our conversation today is to be able to talk about how we make those roads safer. Um, and we brought together um, four of our of experts to be able to have this conversation. Um, our first speaker is Andy Clark. He's Director of Strategy at Tool Design Group. Um, before working at Tool, Andy served for 12 years as the President of the League of American Bicyclists. He's also served as Executive Director of the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals and has been Secretary General of the European Cyclist Federation. Um, in these various roles over 30 years, Andy's been involved in nearly major every major development in bicycling and walking policy and planning, including the formation of the National Complete Streets Coalition and the Safe Routes to School National Partnership, something I was really interested in with my kids couldn't get to their school that was close by. Um, and as well as the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, um, multiple federal transportation funding bills and Vision Zero. Um, as Director of Strategy at Tool Design, Andy draws on his years of experience and extensive network to help state and local clients across the country tackle their most difficult transportation challenges. And in 2018, he was named to the Tool Design's Board of Directors. Supervisor Rodney Lusk was sworn in as the Fairfax County Franconia District Supervisor in January 2020 and is the first African-American male elected to the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. He currently serves as the chairman of the Public Safety Com Committee, among many other, um, which I won't list all, um, leadership roles. Um, but prior to being elected as Franconia District Supervisor, Rodney served as 32 years as a Fairfax County employee, which included roles delivering human services along the historic Richmond Highway um, corridor, the Route 1 corridor. Um, and he served as a member of the Fairfax County Planning Commission and the Fairfax County Park Authority. Um, and one of his priorities, as I'm sure he's going to talk about today, is in, includes improving our pedestrian and bicycle safety network and implementing a rapid bus transit pro program on Richmond Highway. Um, he's talked about the need to improve pedestrian and bicycle safety, citing already two pedestrian deaths this year on Route 1. Um, he said there's no ugly, there's no deadlier road in our county or our commonwealth. We need to move with a sense of urgency to address this public safety crisis. Bill Cutler from the Virginia Department of Transportation is the Deputy District Engineer for VDOT's um, Northern Virginia District, where he oversees construction, project development, and planning and investment management. His teams have significantly raised performance, innovation, and customer service while winning two National Project of the Year awards and a Governor's Technology Award. His 35-year career includes the private sector, a decade with Fairfax County Government and Public Works, Transportation, and the Park Authority, and 22 years with VDOT in Northern Virginia.
And finally, Stuart Schwartz um, from the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Um, he's the executive director and a founder um, for CSG. Um, now 25 years old, CSG is the leading organization in the DC region advocating for walkable, bikeable, inclusive, and transit-oriented communities as the most sustainable and equitable way to grow and provide opportunities for all. Um, he serves on the board of Smart Growth America, the Virginia Conservation Network, and the Richmond Partnership for Smarter Growth. Um, Mr. Schwartz and CSG, CSG have received numerous awards for their work in our region, including the MWCOG um, Regional Partnership Award, um, the Washington Changemaker Award, Washington Business Journal Power 100, and the Catalog for Philanthropy Best Small Charities. This is a, a really power um, group to be able to do this. Our goal is they're each going to present for about 10 minutes um, about their work in this area for being able to tame the arterials. Then we're going to start a conversation amongst them to, because they're going to have some provocative comments. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, so with that, then Andy, do you want to take over the screen and start? Bethany, let me interrupt just briefly. We are going to go for an hour and a half. So we will yes. have time, plenty of time for questions. All right, thanks. Absolutely. And please keep sending your questions in the chat um, so that we can, we can curate them and, and ask them. All right, did I successfully make the transition? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Stuart, um, your bio is impressive. For a minute there, I thought you were going to claim that you were 25 years old, but um, it, it's the organization. It's hard to believe that, that the coalition is um, a quarter century old. Um, so thank you, Bethany, for the introduction and the chance to have this conversation. It is indeed a topic we've been talking about for a long time. Uh, over the course of my career, I've lived for 25 years in Northern Virginia, at the intersection of Gallows and um, Route 29, and I have shared Northern Virginia's arterials with audiences across the country for many decades, and unfortunately, the story doesn't always have a happy ending. The safety numbers, as you mentioned, Bethany, keep getting worse, despite the lessons we've learned. And Dangerous by Design, which I know Stuart will also mention, is the latest in a 50-plus year history of reports and studies that tell us that um, multi-lane 35 mile an hour and higher arterial streets with poor lighting, no bike infrastructure, no crosswalks, very few or limited sidewalks are deadly. And the more lanes and higher the speeds, the more deadly and inhospitable they become for everyone. We know this and we know full well how to change, um, how to reduce speeds, how to eliminate lanes, how to improve crossings, how to add bikeways and pedestrian infrastructure. At Tool Design a couple of years ago, we, we completed a project for the Atlanta Regional Commission um, where uh, we came to exactly the same conclusions. And they asked us to focus on a complete streets strategy book to fix the very typical four and five lane arterials that crisscross that region. And so we provided short and long-term solutions to, uh, to those typical uh, situations. But it was in theory. And so prior to this evening's presentation, I, I asked my colleagues at Tool Design for examples of actual built projects where we have tamed arterial streets. And I got some great examples. The paint is still wet on this from 8th Street in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, Jackson Street in St. Paul, Minnesota in the downtown is a, an amazing transformation. Uh, closer to home at, at Roslyn Circle and Route 29 and Lynn Street in Arlington, Virginia shows that we can indeed uh, transform our streets. But as I got these examples in, another, another pair from Denver, not projects that, that um, Tool Design worked on, but as I got these examples in, I thought, yeah, these are you know, these are cute, but um, uh, we've got case studies we did for, for uh, the Federal Highway Administration's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center using Piney Branch Road as a, as a case study for a, a topic and a webinar and a report on exactly this topic of arterial streets. And I thought it was cute, but like we're talking about Fairfax County. We're talking about big arterials like Route 1 and Route 7 and Route 50 and 29. But I also realized that Yes, while those are bigger and scarier than most arterial streets, actually the principles that you see in something like Piney Branch Road, the tools we have for taming them are very much and fundamentally the same. 
The Piney Branch case study, for example, demonstrates how to redesign intersections, how to provide safer crossings for pedestrians in particular, how to reduce the speed of turning traffic, how to better protect vulnerable road users like cyclists and pedestrians, how to reduce the amount of, of empty and ambiguous pavement space um, and connect better to other modes of, of travel. And these are all uh, tools that we can use on bigger streets and bigger arterials. Many of those principles that, that I just showed you are on display near the Tool Design World Headquarters in Silver Spring. And I also realized, as you alluded to, that not all suburban arterials uh, look and feel and have exactly the same function. Some are commercial main streets like this uh, formerly six lane, now four lane um, arterial in Long Beach, California. Uh, others are much more like Gallows Road, which I, I know very well. Uh, there are a lot of arterials that are three, four and five lane uh, roads where those uh, types of um, fixes can be deployed and in Richmond over the last two or three years, um, a, a number of, of four lane streets have been transformed into more walkable, more bikeable streets with, uh, with paint and posts. And of course, those paint and posts can be turned over time into more permanent and concrete solutions. So I would argue that there are really a lot of things we can use to tame arterial streets and to make them more walkable and bike friendly and transit accessible if we allow ourselves and have the courage to do so. Because the one critical ingredient with many of the changes I just showed is that, what they, is that they change the status quo and do things differently, which as it turns out, really is the only way to achieve different outcomes. So let me offer a few suggestions on how we can tame suburban arterials. First, let's stop repeating the mistakes of the past and building things that we know are dangerous to pedestrians and people on bikes that make walking, biking, and transit more difficult. And let's also stop asking transportation agencies to fix land use decisions, which is something I know Stuart is going to talk about in more depth. Second, let's change some of the rules and assumptions that we have imposed on ourselves that prevent our progress. On your left is Buford Highway in Atlanta. It used to be, maybe still is, the poster child of the dangerous suburban arterial street. The state DOT over the last several years has spent a small fortune on nice brick pavers in the median and adding a buffer to the sidewalk. They've added sidewalks sometimes taking adjacent property and parking lots, building retaining walls. The one thing they haven't actually changed is the character of the roadway. It's still six lanes, it's still high speed, there's still no place to ride a bike, and there are very few crossing places for pedestrians. Now, one reason Buford Highway looks the way it does is that it has to function as a backup for when the parallel interstate is blocked or, as happened, catches fire. On the right is downtown Harrisonburg. We're told that we can't use most of the traffic calming techniques on the two most significant streets in the heart of a, of a downtown like Harrisonburg, because for a few hours, a handful of times of a year, it has to carry detour traffic from a crash on I-81. On I That's the reason we're choosing not to provide permanent safe streets for biking and walking 365 days a year, 24 seven. We make that same choice every time we use level of service metrics and determine that because for as little as sometimes 15 minutes in an hour in the peak times, things might get congested. And so we deny ourselves the opportunity to create permanent safe streets every day of the year. Third, we should switch, our, switch some of our priorities and uh, reverse our thinking. One of the very simplest ways I think to tame arterial streets is to make cars leaving the arterial turn across raised crosswalks or extended sidewalks, um, often a cycle track if, if there's one there. This would mean, of course, that the cars have to slow down, slow enough that if there's a collision, no one is killed or seriously injured. This is a common practice in Northern Europe, but here, not just in Northern Virginia, in the US, we choose not to do this precisely because it will force drivers to slow down and potentially inconvenience other drivers or cause rear end collisions. And that's because we've set the speed limit at 35 miles an hour or higher. That's our, our choice. 
we can do that differently. We can choose a safe system approach and use engineering techniques like this to slow turning traffic down. But actually it gets worse. Not only do we not make that choice, we often go even further and provide a right turn lane, sometimes more than one, so that turning traffic doesn't slow down through traffic. And then we double down again on that decision by creating a wide turning radius in that turn lane so cars can keep turning at 30 to 35 miles an hour as they make the turn. As I mentioned, I lived for 25 years at this near this intersection. I saw a change from two lanes, from two four lane roads to an intersection where there are now nine lanes of traffic to cross at each leg. The crossing distance is 160 feet from crosswalk edge to crosswalk edge. The intersection simply isn't bike and pedestrian friendly. And as you're crossing, there's no moment when there isn't right turning traffic making a right turn on red or left turning traffic making a, a unprotected left turn or a protected left turn, sorry, um, crossing your path. This design is for, drive, is for cars and for drivers. This intersection improvement was a probably, um, you know better than me, uh, a 30 million plus project. And yet it literally took a decade for the person on the left waiting for the bus to get a bus shelter installed. 10 years. On the right, this situation on Lee Highway, a little further down the road, um, uh, just uh, um, a little further down the road, I, um, I'll, not, I'll get lost giving directions, um, is still like this. We're, we've been waiting more than a decade to close a gap in a path on a major arterial highway in a, in a rapidly developing area, probably because the project limits didn't extend that far. Well, how about if we redefine project limits to connect sidewalks to the next section of crosswalk or sidewalk? Because we will never tame, successfully tame arterial traffic if we keep kidding ourselves that solutions like this will make a difference. These are all in Florida, so I think these signs have been removed in the last 24 hours. Uh, we wish everyone there well. Um, and, and let's similarly be honest about whether we can really make diverging diamond intersections or other alternative intersections pedestrian friendly or bikeable. It's honestly as elusive as the bike friendly rumble strip. They are incompatible by definition. Researchers have identified 20 different red flags, as they call them, that these intersections create that designers need to fix uh, if they are to work for people on foot on bike at some point. And at some point, we have to accept that these are simply incompatible with active travel and sustainable thriving communities. They are only being built to move more cars faster, possibly. So if you want to build a large, complex, busy suburban arterial intersection and also have people walking and biking, you have to give people on foot and bike the same or better priority and access than people in cars. And you have to totally separate them from traffic like this example in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Going back and closing to the uh, bicycling chef on Route 7 in Tyson's Corner, that roadway has changed in the 15 years since I took that picture. It's been improved. There's now a sidewalk, which is an improvement, but there's still no place to ride. And honestly, it's an even uglier and more inhospitable place than before. Can we really say that's better in a material way? Well, safety is critical. Taming suburban arterials is about much more. It's about health, safety, equity, quality of life, sustainability, community, access, and suburban arterials fail to deliver on many of those levels. We have to have the courage to follow these rules and to tame suburban arterials, not because I say so, but because we say we're supposed to be doing this. If you look at our at the comprehensive plan for Fairfax County, if you look at VDOT documents, if you look at the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority, we're supposed to be eliminating fatalities, reducing single occupant vehicle travel, reducing VMT, increasing bike and pedestrian use, and our suburban arterials today are honestly doing none of those things. So it's time we did something different and we know what to do. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Bethany. I'm, I'm over here cheering um, and, and loving those diagrams. So 
Thank you so much. That's going to really inspire some conversation. Um, next, I want to be able to turn it over to um, Supervisor Lasky. Yes, I'm ready. Uh, thank you very much, Bethany. Um, I want to take uh, just a moment to thank the uh, Fairfax Alliance for Better Biking, the, the Tool Design Group, and the Coalition for Smarter Growth. And congratulations, Stuart, on 25 years. I, I'm also surprised by that. Uh, thank you all for sponsoring this very important uh, conversation. I appreciate your invitation and the chance to be here to be part of this panel to talk about an issue that is very important uh, to me personally. Um, I'll make the point that um, I knew that coming in the public office was going to be difficult, but I'm going to say, trust me, it's been more difficult than I expected. But one of the most challenging parts of this job and something I did not expect is that I receive phone calls and those phone calls are from the commanders of the different police stations in my district. One is the Mount Vernon uh, station and the second is the uh, Franconia station. And they call to let me know when we've had a pedestrian or a bicyclist get hit or killed um, in the district. And in my very first month in office uh, back in January of 2020, I got two of these calls, um, two very distinct tragedies along the Richmond Highway corridor. And I think we can all attest it is the deadliest uh, roadway here in the Commonwealth. And unfortunately, I still get them. And, un and unfortunately, they do not get any easier. Now, one of my first priorities uh, when I came into office was to ensure that we as a county were focused and redoubling our efforts to improve bicycle and pedestrian safety. I introduced uh, a board matter in partnership with my colleague, uh, Walter Alcorn from the Hunter Mill District, aimed at starting a conversation about how we could actually do that. Now the board matter asked the county to establish a timeline and provide public communication strategy for the active Fairfax plan. It also asked staff to reevaluate the way we fund pedestrian and bicycle projects, and how we can improve safety now without waiting, this is crazy, without waiting until the active Fairfax plan was complete. Since that time, the Board of Supervisors has dedicated, and this is great, over $90 million solely to pedestrian and bicycle safety projects, which we will be deploying over the next six years. And I wanna give a nod here to Supervisor John Faust, he championed this issue, and uh, all of us members of the board felt that this was something that was necessary and important, and were able to support it. Um, additionally, we financed the study to reduce, and this is with the help of VDOT, the speed limit on much of Richmond Highway to 35 miles per hour. We also redesigned the Richmond Highway BRT project to significantly reduce the number of lanes at our major intersections. And we can talk more about that later. Um, these are only some of the important victories that we've had, and we certainly, certainly need to have more. One other vital and important effort that I wanted to touch on here is the role of technology in helping us in our decision making. So last year, the county hosted the Smart City Innovation Challenge for bicycle and pedestrian safety. And many of you will remember the winner of that challenge was an organization called Street Simplified, who I later had the pleasure of meeting and, and talking with their CEO. Their goal uh, was to pilot a project that uses video detection and AI technology to offer data-backed countermeasures at some of the county's most challenging intersections for both pedestrians and also for uh, bicycles. The work that they've been undertaking uh, has been done over the past summer. And although we've not yet gotten the results, and I will say I'm eagerly awaiting them, they're gonna be able to tell us where uh, we have you know, issues with conflict between drivers and pedestrians, and I think drivers and cyclists, and this is gonna help us make some critical decisions. Um, I also noted after meeting with the folks from Street Simplified, I recognize that we as a county can do better 
to use technology to inform our decisions and improve the infrastructure network that we have here in Fairfax. And that is why in the last budget cycle, I pushed to include a new position in the Fairfax County Department of Transportation focused on emerging technology. This position, uh, which will be um, formally involved and uh, identified as the Innovative Mobility Programs Manager, will focus entirely on identifying opportunities to implement cutting edge technologies and programs in Fairfax County. This position will be vitally important in bringing our Department of Transportation into the era of uh, new transportation planning. Now, before I end, I wanna say that these efforts would not be possible without the support and partnership of so many of the different people and groups that are on this call today. So again, I wanna thank the Coalition for Smarter Growth. I also wanna thank the Fairfax Alliance for Better Bicycling, because you've really shown your ability to be incredible advocates for a safer community here in Fairfax. And I appreciate all the work that you do, and I'm so delighted to be here and join the discussion on this topic here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your, your advocacy and the kind of work you're doing is really a model for what we need to be doing. So thank you. Sure. Uh, I will come back with questions, but next I want to um, bring in um, Bill Cutler. Are you ready to, to share the screen? Excellent. So you're still on mute, though. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes All sir. right. Thank you so much. And I'm here with Jessica Paris, our uh, Deputy District uh, Traffic Operations Director, and she'll be uh, taking up my last slides here. But I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to speak. Appreciate the goals of the uh, whole team, the organization, and all the partnerships that we've forged. And I want to talk a little bit. I'm just going to jump in to uh, some things about that we're, we're doing at VDOT to serve our community here in Northern Virginia. Um, first, we're proud uh, statewide to have been named one of the top 10 bicycle friendly states. Um, obviously this doesn't happen without uh, a lot of different people, a lot of uh, people with great vision all across the Commonwealth. But in my opinion, I think a lot of it rests up here in Northern Virginia that has helped uh, to gain uh, the score. And I note that we went from 17th up to seventh uh, since the last survey. So. It's something to be proud of. It's not something anyone's resting their laurels on. I know we all want to challenge ourselves to do better, continue to do better and to do more, but it is still a, a notable uh, honor. Uh, I want to talk a bit about some of the arterial projects that we're working on in, in terms of bike and ped. Um, an important connection under construction right now uh, between major employment centers and, and living centers, Tyson's and Reston. We have seven miles of Route 7 under construction right now. Um, and the project includes a shared use path on both, uh, both sides of um, the arterial highway. Uh, that's uh, 14 miles of, uh, of multi-use path with a single project. And I do wanna tell you in my long career, I've not been involved in a project that has that many miles of multi-purpose trail in a single project. Um, we're also paying attention to the, the roadway uh, crossings. I believe we have four leg, four legged crosswalks on, on many key intersections, ped buttons, et cetera. But I also wanna point out it's got important connections to the uh, Spring Hill Metro station, the trail will provide, as well as uh, connections to the Fairfax County Parkway trail and the Cross County Trail, which is a north-south trail that actually have great separation. So folks enjoying, enjoying the Cross County Trail will not have to uh, um, deal with the traffic on uh, Route 7. And we've all, we're also providing a pedestrian underpass for Colvin Run Mill Park, which is an FCPA pro uh, property. And we're essentially connecting two parts of the park that had been divided um, decades, uh, many decades ago. So something valuable. We feel that we're, you know, in partnership with Fairfax County government and other other partners, you know, we're helping provide new assets to the community and improving the trail network. Along that line, and Supervisor Lusk uh, mentioned, um, 
this project in Southern Fairfax County, uh, which will have uh, eight, uh, I believe eight BRT stops or eight pairs of BRT stops between Huntington and Fort Belvoir. And it will really be reimagining uh, and revitalizing um, the Richmond Highway Corridor. Uh, this project, as you mentioned, we, we are not including um, turn lanes, right turn lanes in a lot of instances that I believe in the past we would have provided uh, more right turn lanes, which would have provided a longer crossing time necessary for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, the, the entire project, and there's about a billion dollars being invested in this between Fairfax County's uh, road, bike and trail uh, project and VDOTs and the BRT in the middle. Uh, it's over a billion dollars um, missing from this uh, illustration is the nodal development that uh, we believe together we're encouraging uh, in near each of the uh, eight uh, BRT station pairs. So we'll, we'll have opportunities for redevelopment, more, uh, uh, more dense uh, housing and uh, more quality uh, redevelopment of the area. And I just wanna say for VDOT's portion of this project, which ours is about three miles long, our share of the, road, of the roadway length, but within the three miles that we're doing, we're gonna have 12 miles of bike and ped. So we've got a cycle track on each side and we've got a sidewalk on each side. So I just want to repeat within a three mile segment of roadway widening, we've got 12 miles of bike and ped facilities, something that I personally think is, is pretty impressive. And obviously we have to pay attention to the details as well, and the, the, the side street crossings, et cetera. But uh, again, a transformational project uh, for that area. Um, and then north, uh, further north on uh, Route 1 in Arlington County, uh, we're looking at um, the complete streets approach to uh, Route 1. And this is in the area of Crystal City and Pentagon City, and obviously where Amazon uh, HQ2 is going to be. Uh, this, this project, which is in the study phase, we're envisioning, we're actually going to lower the highway and remove a couple of highway type grade separations uh, and provide uh, a lot more uh, multimodal features as you can see here and try to make it uh, a better um, community for all users. Um, this project is also, we're studying it right now to lower the speed, speed limit in this area to 25 uh, miles an hour. That study's underway. And I should have said on the previous slide uh, in Richmond Highway with Supervisor Lusk and others, we're, we're looking to reduce that speed limit to 35 miles per hour, uh, which is another very important feature in how we're attempting to transform some of these arterial streets as we work on these large scale projects. Uh, I wanna take a moment uh, to point out this, this is a, the Capitol Beltway in Tyson's, many of you will recognize and uh, next month, it's my hope that we will be opening up this new uh, bike and pedestrian uh, facility. Uh, it's really going to be transformational. On the, on the right side of the picture, you see the forest, but behind the forest are hundreds of units for, of um, condos and apartments and really represents thousands of people that live there. Uh, and I believe this is really going to transform it for them. They now have the opportunity to walk from their apartment and condo or bike uh, over to uh, Tyson's Corner Center, which is on the left. You can see that I think the movie theater area right there on the left. And obviously the uh, Silver Line, uh, Tyson's uh, station on the Silver Line is also right there uh, just beyond. So a transformational type project. And uh, I know for also for Bruce Wright and others that try to traverse the parkway or the, the beltway at Route 7, this will be a significant improvement um, and, uh, for that as well. All right, um, I, we did win a couple of national projects of the years. I wanna mention this one is in Tyson's. You can see it's close to uh, Capital One's corporate headquarters and Hilton Worldwide as well, but this is a relatively new crossing of the Capital Beltway. Um, but it includes wide sidewalks and includes on, on road bike lanes. Uh, and it also includes a direct connection of those facilities to 
uh, the McLean Metro Station uh, in the distance. Uh, it also has direct connections to the Capitol Beltway Express lanes, which as you know, can be used for free by buses and provides an opportunity to really expand the transit network uh, and grow our community in a different way, offering, offering multiple modes of uh, travel. Uh, next, uh, this, this project uh, a few years old, not uh, just a couple years old, but I just love the picture. I wanted to share it with you all. Um, we also did do some work for the Fairfax or for the um, Northern Virginia Park Authority, Nova Parks. And this is over the Arturo Route 29 in the near the Arlington Falls Church border uh, and uh, provides a, a, a much better flow of the WNOD trail. Uh, it is the Nova Parks Trail, but VDOT will uh, have built and will maintain this bridge uh, for our community. Uh, and then I want to turn it over to, uh, to Jessica Paris, who's going to talk a little bit about some of our systemic safety improvements in the next few minutes that we have left. Jessica? Thank you, Bill. Thank you all for inviting us here tonight. Uh, those were great projects that Bill just displayed for us um, with our larger capital improvement projects. But our VDOT program, we don't have to wait for those large capital projects. And our highway safety improvement program highlights some of our lower cost projects. Um, in 2019, the Commonwealth Transportation Board um, passed a new program for us with our highway safety um, improvement funds where we are investing a lot of our dollars now into systemic projects rather than spot improvement projects. Our systemic projects, um, there's eight of them in the first phase that are shown here on this slide. Those are shown to be up to nine times more effective at reducing fatalities and serious injuries per dollar spent as compared to the larger projects. Um, I won't go through all of these in detail on the list, but I'm sure folks are, are well aware of some of these projects um, that we've been delivering throughout Northern Virginia, the Flashing Yellow Arrow Project, the High Visibility Signal Backplate Project. You guys have probably driven through intersections and, and seen those improvements underway. Um, the one that I would like to highlight mostly is the Signalized Pedestrian Crossings Program. Um, this program, we had over 400 intersections that were eligible for improvements as part of this systemic safety initiative. We're spending about $50,000 per intersection um, for design and construction for improvements that include new and retrofit crosswalks, uh, pedestrian signal heads, countdown signal heads, access accessible pedestrian signals, etc. cetera. Um, locations that are eligible for this program are on our pedestrian safety action plan corridors. The pedestrian safety action plan or PSAP, our VDOT inaugural plan um, came out in 2018 and that was PSAP version 1.0. Um, since then, there's been two other iterations and we're now on PSAP version 3.0. Um, and this is a data-driven method to um, identify locations that are based on crash risk, pedestrian crash risk, uh, as well as a history of pedestrian crashes as well. Um, I think we're reaching the end of our time here. Uh, so I'd love to talk about this program in more detail where we have a lot of locations that we're delivering improvements for along Route 1, along Route 7, several of the other corridors we've been discussing. Terrific, thank you. And yes, uh, you're coming right at the end of your time, but we hope that if people have got questions that you're available to be able to answer as we as we re as we get further into the discussion. So thank you all. Um, and finally, we've got Stuart Schwartz from the Coalition for for um, Smarter Growth. Are you ready to take the screen? Stuart? You're in ready. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm I'm batting clean up here, and I kind of like doing that. Uh, I really appreciate the presentations by Bill and his team, and Andy, and cer certainly Supervisor Lusk, and thank you for those kind words for our veteran organization. And I also want to especially thank Sonia Brehe, who is our Northern Virginia Advocacy Manager. Uh, she was also the past president of Fairfax Alliance for Better Bicycling and serves on the board of uh, North, Northern Virginia Families for Safe Streets. Uh, some of this presentation is from a recent one she did to, at a Vision Zero Safety Summit with WABA, and I've added some mix for from our vision for the region, our blueprint for a better region. 
Uh, this is our territory where CSG works. And as you can see, we advocate for walkable, bikeable, inclusive, transit-oriented communities as the most sustainable and equitable way for our region to grow and provide opportunities for all. Uh, essentially, our vision is this network of, of communities that will be safer, more affordable, more accessible, uh, provide greater access to opportunities for jobs, and also help us with climate change. And on that note, I want us all to, to think about the folks down in Florida right now and those who are about to feel it in, in the Carolinas, the impact of this unprecedented hurricane. Uh, I hope we don't have to convince anybody anymore about climate change. We are told we have eight years to slash our emissions and a key place where we can all do it at the local level is with our transportation and land use and housing policies. And if we can, uh, transportation is the number one source of our emissions right now and EVs will help, but they will not be enough. We also have to reduce the amount we have to drive. And that's why it's in some ways very frustrating to have to fight sort of street by street, road by road to make places more walkable and bikeable and transit accessible. You've heard about Smart Growth America's amazing dangerous by design report and also disturbing report. Um, they've seen an 20, we've seen a 20, 62% increase in fatalities since 2009, 64,000 plus deaths in total among pedestrians only. Um, that's a 4.7% increase in 2020 over 2019. And preliminary data shows 20, 21 is just as bad, if not getting worse. Arterial highways are just 15% of our lane miles, but 67% of pedestrian deaths, hence our forum tonight. And people of color, particularly Native and Black Americans, lower income folks, and older people are also more likely to die by walking. They're also, you know, often more dependent often um, on walking, biking, and using transit, or their communities are the ones that are divided by these large arterials. This is from VDOT's own pedestrian safety access uh, action plan. The top 1% safety challenge corridors with higher risk are shown in red. And you can see it's really our big roads, our big arterials in uh, Northern Virginia. And then we've got a lot of top 5% corridors as well. So a lot of work to do. And you've seen the headlines. It's been alluded to by uh, Bethany and others uh, and, and by Supervisor Lusk. You know, this is a serious, serious public health uh, problem. And we know about these arterials. We've been along many of them. Right now, CSG, led by Sonia, is working on Route 7 and Bailey's Crossroads, partnering with many others on Route 1. On Route 7, we're teaming with CASA. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But we're seeing high speed limits and high volumes of traffic, high speeds, uh, multiple lanes, places with missing sidewalks, few safe crossings, no medians, and so forth. You know, the shot above in Route 7 and even, you know, Route 1, both, you've seen very little change over many years there in many places. In a number of places, Supervisor Lust, Supervisor Stork, uh, former Supervisor, now Chairman McKay, have worked on safety components of this, but it's in not enough places for, for these corridors. So you've heard about the Richmond Highway Corridor uh, plan. It's widening from four to six lanes with center running bus rapid transit with its own uh, dedicated bus only lanes, got a small typo there, um, and adding separated two-way cycle tracks on sidewalks. Um, there are ongoing safety concerns, but you've heard how Supervisor Lusk, Supervisor Stork, and VDOT are, are listening and starting to tackle some of these things uh, in terms of removing left turn lanes, uh, in terms of uh, setting the speed at 35 miles per hour, uh, trying to make some other design changes, including um, narrower lanes. We've, we're, we've agreed to 11 foot lanes. In some cases, I think we could do 10 or 10 and a half, at least for some of the lanes, if not the outside lanes. But we've got you know challenges. You see the illustration above. It makes for a very wide road. And I don't know if these are before the recent changes or, uh, or uh, after them or unchanged sections of the corridor. We're not going to get into the design detail. But Andy has shown how we can design these intersections more safely. One of the other problems is how far apart the intersections are. And the ones at, in red are 2,500 feet. You know, typically in an urban environment in a city, 400 feet would be nice. 600 feet would be the max um, that I'd want to see. And, and many people would want to see. I drew a line at the 500 uh, foot mark here. And you can see 
how many places where we do not have that short of passing just on Route 1, which for years people said, this is our main street, we want it to be our main street. Uh, so the community in Gum Springs has been waiting a long time. This is similar to a fight in 1967. And like then they have rolled a, symbol, a coffin as an important and, and sad and tragic symbol of the risk that people face crossing Route 1. The good news here is we have a zebra crosswalk, but it doesn't look like we have on one on the other side of the intersections here. And there is, this is part of the ongoing concern about what the ultimate width of Route 1 would be. Uh, here's Route 7, where we're working for safer Route 7. You can see on the right the high-speed entrances into the gas station. Sadly, someone was killed uh, last year uh, where there was not a safe crossing or a complete crosswalk in, in that particular sec section. Some crosswalks have been added over time, but uh, generally the road has not changed since I took a picture on here 20 years ago. This is a more recent one by Sonia. Like I said, we are working with CASA, terrific partners. Uh, they reached out to 1,200 households, knocked on 1,200 doors. They had 200 and some surveys that were filled out. We did a safety audit together uh, in the corridor. We have done rallies. And you can look while we're just while we're out there at these events, you can see people crossing at intersections that are not marked that should be legal crossing points and should be safe crossing points, but are not today. Uh, it resulted, uh, thank you, Vida, a major public meeting had 100 plus people, maybe 150 people at that meeting and this young man testifying, it exemplifies the concern of the community for safety. And uh, this is an important part of the work we're doing with CASA and other partners, but we shouldn't have to work, you know, sort of street by street. And that's why I think this meeting is so important that we're having tonight. Thank you, Fairfax, looking at active transportation and safe streets for all with major studies and the investment you just heard about. Uh, Andy's talked a lot about this. We've talked talked a little bit about, I will not go into all the details about what it would take to make a safer arterial, but I think we know how to do it. And that's what firms like Tool Design are great at helping our DOTs work through. But we face these challenges. We're prioritizing convenience over safety in people's lives as a focus on moving cars over people. To some extent, this is a political problem. It's an education problem. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to change the way we think about the world and the way that we design our communities. And it's not an easy thing. Too often we do see victims blamed, the vulnerable pedestrian, uh, you know, like not in a crosswalk. We don't always know whether it actually happened to be a legal crossing, but without a marked crosswalk. And often it's because it's a failure to recognize the role that design plays. And police reports, I don't think adequately recognize that. Police are very busy, very quickly have to fill out the reports. But I think it would help if we had more notes about the design challenges at a particular site. And then the media reports don't pick it up either, the design issue. Honestly, the traffic models are flawed. Regional traffic models overproject future traffic, predict volumes that are higher than the road could ever take in the future, but then that feeds into the intersection models and the DOTs feel the pressure to then widen. There's often the claim that there's no money. Well, there's plenty of money. We're just spending it on about a thousand lane miles of road expansion in Northern Virginia, according to the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority plan. But instead of just expanding highways and creating more auto dependent places, we could retrofit and spend the money on making our existing roads safer. And honestly, a failure to recognize the benefits of mixed use walkable transit accessible neighborhoods for reducing the amount we have to drive and giving us other options. One of my favorites, and this is an early picture because they're still building in this stretch of Route 1 in Potomac Yard, we have the Metro Way. I think actually, honestly, those bus lines could be a little bit narrower. But what's also interesting here is that they did tuck the left turns in. I know we're going to be doing that on Route 1 in uh, Fairfax, but what's key is that it's only two lanes in each direction for the cars, and it's 25 mile per hour speed. And by building up to the street, we get a sense of enclosure. That is the hope we're getting, that we have with Embark Richmond Highway, the TOD plan for that corridor. Uh, but again, we're six lanes of through traffic, the two BRT lanes, and in some cases, you know, with turn lanes and larger intersections, which I think may divide us too much in the Route 1 corridor. But it's not all VDOT's fault. I mean, Andy alluded to land use. Uh, it is really how we designed our communities from the outset uh, in our suburban, as, as suburbia grew. Our earliest suburban suburbs were streetcar suburbs, first horse-drawn and then trolley and electrified suburbs. And those were still walkable like cities. They still tied to the walking distance it took, you know, to get to that, to that streetcar on a a nice main street or, or a street through the residential community. But 
Then we started designing with separated uses and like in the upper right hand, all those trips have to be on the main arterial uh, as compared to traditional development uh, or new urbanism on the lower left. And this is how trips happen. You can see all the trips on the arterial on the upper right versus options to travel within a community and not have to take every trip on the arterial. So to some extent, you know, we're victims of, of this and VDOT is forced to try to fix it. Honestly, we're in a debate with the developers again over a law we got passed in 2007 that the, that the outer suburban developers keep weakening, not the urban ones, that is requires subdivision connectivity. They don't want as much connectivity. They just want to push the burden on the public arterials. Kudos to former supervisor Linda Smith from the Providence District who got this connection. You can see a parallel street here. Uh, that was part of the plan for the Mosaic District, but it's that last connection down at the bottom here near Williams Drive that didn't exist and that we got connected through. Um, so uh, that's a parallel to Gallows. It's a par parallel to the other road to the left, and it gives you another option. So again, we're spending billions of dollars on widening your roads and highways, building more auto dependency. It's time we shift that funding to making these other roads safer and create the mixed use walkable places we need to have. Because this is the world we built. We are trying to fix this place, Tyson's Corner. It's taking longer than we hoped. We are trying to fix Route 1, so it is not this terrible place for our children. And we're planning for their future, a better world. And for all of our futures, because that's where we're all headed. This is a couple walking in Reston Town Center. And that's what we need to do together. And I'll wrap up here. There's my contact information and Sonia's as well. And we'll share out the presentations. Thank you all. Thank you. What a fantastic presentation. So I guess my provocative question I want to throw out for y'all to have a conversation with each other about um, is, it connects to what all of you have been talking about, but it can't, a conversation Andy and I um, were having last, I think last week, was this question of what happens if we put communities first before cars, right? What if we turn around it? I mean, even all the conversations we've been having so far today, all are about accommodations for bikes and pedestrians rather than putting bikes and pedestrians and communities as the uh, you know, connecting communities as the first point of what we're trying to do. Um, thinking about Gum Springs, for example. And then we build for cars. What do we need to do to make that happen? And what I'm, I'm thinking in particular, uh, you know, so Supervisor Lusk, like what are the kind of political pressures that keep us from being able to do that? So I, I want you to talk amongst yeah. yourselves to answer that question. Yeah, it, it, maybe I should start if that's okay. Um, just going to make a couple points. Uh, the first is I, I want to acknowledge uh, BDOT's uh, response to some of the issues that were brought forward um, as a result of the Gum Springs uh, protest with the coffin, the one that we saw with that very stark and strong imagery. Um, BDOT was responsive to looking at changing uh, a number of the uh, numbers of lanes that were necessary at some of the major intersections. We had this conversation about them looking at the reduction in the speed limit, and I want to acknowledge that that is something that they also looked at very carefully and came back with a recommendation that we could reduce the speed limit. So going to the point that you made, you know, being responsive to the community, I guess in this case, we were being responsive to the community sentiment that we heard. and both Supervisor Stork and myself were certainly 100% uh, in solidarity um, because, as I said earlier, the, the issues on the corridor are very grave as we see the number of folks who are unfortunately losing their lives. And I think um, Stewart made this point about sometimes they do get blamed. Um, they're the blamed victims, but I, I don't feel that way, and I agree with him in, 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 in the assessment that we've got to figure out how we make these roadways and these connections safer so that people aren't put in a position where they might decide to cross at a midpoint location versus uh, at the quote-unquote intersection. And the, dis the distances, the, the point that Stuart made there too, the distances are so great for some of these intersections that you're basically almost 
forcing people to make this decision. And then the other issue, which we didn't really talk about, and, and one that we have, is lighting. And I think we, we do need to be, you know, attuned to looking at ways to, you know, improve lighting. But I made the point earlier in my comments that technology can help us with this too. So if we have sensors in certain locations, then they can trigger lights to come on as people are moving or driving past. This could create, you know, a situation where you could see someone if they've made a decision. And not to say that the decision is right, but they've made a decision to enter into the road at a place that might not give them the greatest visibility. The light comes on and we're hopefully going to be able to see them. So these sorts of technologies and, 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 and things are important. But then to your point too, Bethany, sorry, I'm not trying to ramble here, but I think there's a, that number of things that we're trying to cover. Um, you know, it, I mean, politically, yeah, there, there's always competing demands and there's always competing interests on pretty much everything. And, you know, usually it's predicated on finances. And I, and I heard Stuart's point too, um, you know, but you, you've got to be able to designate monies for pedestrian and um, bicycle improvements. And I want to commend the board. And again, this is something that we needed to do. We were able to identify funding that will help us. And that's, it's not going to solve the problem like tomorrow, but it puts us in a pathway that will give us an opportunity to fix some of these intersections and get them to a place where they're a lot safer than they are today. And I think what we have to do is continue to advocate for this type of funding and to and and to ensure that um, we have some process where we're able to deploy the dollars where there is the greatest need. Because I think to some degree we have a challenge in that we have hundreds and hundreds of projects that have been put on lists over, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years. And so the question is, which ones do you fund first? And to me, this is where I think, you know, technology can help us, help us have empirical data about the risks and the dangers. Some of it's anecdotal, but some of it can be actually documented, right? So then we're deploying our resources in those places that are going to have the greatest impact and solve a significant problem. So with that, let me um, go ahead and let my colleagues here jump in. Bethany Stewart, I would add, you know, for us as smart growthers, it is all interconnected. So again, as I mentioned, it's how we design our communities. And um, we, we have created these tax funding sources, including for the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority that are on autopilot. And yet things like affordable housing have to beg for the money every year and don't have automatic sources that often. They have some, but they're not yeah. quite as large as we're spending on the highway system. And this is a federal problem, a state problem, and a local problem. Mm -hmm. uh, our housing, uh, affordable housing funding for homes in walkable transit-oriented areas, uh, planning and zoning changes like we're doing, trying to do with Embark Richmond Highway to bring things closer together, create a grid of streets and so forth, are all going to be key to reducing the amount that that we have to drive and um, and it bring, and it provides that connectivity and putting people first part of it. It's in it's in the plan, but too often we're finding on the transportation so more funding for housing in these locations, obviously shifting funding that we can shift to ped bike investments, but also to local street investments and street connectivity. Instead of point to point long distance travel that we continue to try to support through uh, road expansion, we've been talking about how you need to have a transit oriented development transportation package. It's the street grid, it's the safe streets designed for those streets, it's the transit um, connect, connect connectivity for those transit oriented places. Because again, anybody who can live and work and access a transit accessible place is helping solve our larger transportation problems. It's nodes versus these long links. And I think that's gonna be an important part of what we do. Um, I, I'll continue some of those thoughts and, and acknowledge that the question gets more and more complex and I've got more and more things to say after Supervisor Lusk spoke and then uh, Stuart. But I, um, I think whether it's technology we're talking about, whether it's 
uh, investment policy, whether it's the engineering um, tools that we choose to use. Fundamentally, I think your question, Bethany, is addressed by getting back to the, the values that we have and the reason why we're doing any of this work. And for the longest time, I had an old boss who used to always remind me that um, departments of transportation and public works um, are like military machines in doing the job they've been trained and told to do for decades. We just need to tell them to do something slightly different. They will be equally ruthless in their efficiency and their determination to get the job done. And, and it's, it's um, changing that mission by acknowledging that whereas for the last 50 years, we have been building a, a suburban model, auto dependent, um, based on racism, fear, uh, all kinds of, of sort of somewhat malign influences and, 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 and approaches to the world, to our, our worldview, We're, we need to change that. We need to acknowledge that actually commuting, which has dominated every transportation model for the last 50 years, Stuart, is only 15% of the trips that we make, 18%, maybe 20 at most in most metropolitan areas in the country. And yet it's the, it's the primary thing that we measure and care about is the commuting trip. The commuting trip is largely dominated by wealthy white suburban car drivers. And that is the way, uh, that, that's, that's what we have um, paid to invest in, chosen to invest in. And it's not really a surprise, Stuart, that those last few pictures you showed are this, you know, we end up with the system that we've got. So if we can shift the values, acknowledge that actually perhaps transportation is not an end in itself, but a means to an end, and it's a means to an end of, uh, of a just society, of, of equitable communities, of thriving, um, diverse uh, communities where people don't have to travel, where they don't have to risk their lives to set foot outside the door and get to school or go to the shops. You know, we, we have it within our power to do that. The technology you talk about, um, you know, can be used for good. It can also be left to run riot with our communities. The simple and obvious example that I'll use before Stuart gets to it, because I, I know one of us will. We have the technology to control and geo the speed and geofence electric scooters, but we won't apply that same technology to cars or trucks or buses. We've, I know we're excited about the variable speed limits being uh, trialed or piloted on, on sections of, of I-95. That's been normal standard operating procedure on motorways throughout Europe for the last 25 years since, since I left uh, the mother country back in, in the late 1980s. So, um, you know, these, the technology and the tools are there for us um, if we choose to use them, and, and it's how we use them based on our values that I think is important moving forward. Uh, hi, it's Bill. I, I did want to just jump in, and I think Bruce wants to move on to the next question, but I do want to say as a state DOT, you know, we, we are a reflection of our community, right? The projects that we do, whatever they are, are a reflection of what our community wants now. Obviously, not all of our community, you know, are we guided by uh, developers? Are we guided by uh, the interests of the car community, for the bicycle community, um, the, the uh, transit community, what have you? Um, we're, we're a reflection of ultimately the decisions made by the, by the collective, but I think we have evolved, and I want to give you quick examples of our ev evolution, although I already did in my slideshow, but when I joined VDOT, granted uh, quite some time ago, so it's a little bit of an old story, but I used to have to fill out a form and send it to Richmond explaining why I wanted to put a trail or a sidewalk with my roadway improvement project, uh, which sounds crazy, but that's the way it was back when I joined VDAT. But for the last 15 years, because this is an old story, you know, I have to fill out a form now to explain why I'm not going to include a sidewalk or a trail as part of my transportation project. So that, that is an indication of how this organization can evolve because our community evolves. And, uh, you know, as we look at, you know, Bike to Work Day, which I've been doing for decades with Bruce and Fab and others, uh, you know, I see more and more and more people. I wonder if we're, you know, are we at a tipping point where this becomes 
you know, greater and greater interest. Um, Supervisor Lusk has pointed out, I mean, Fairfax County is really stepping up with dedicated funding for bike and ped safety uh, all across the county. I believe it's roughly a hundred million dollars of plan. I, I don't know if it's all approved, but a plan is a hundred million dollars over six years, which is extraordinary. Now I've given an example or two of where we have done a project that's just about uh, bike and ped, but granted most of them are elements of a larger road project, um, but it is possible. And so if, if we had funding dedicated uh, for that, um, we, we, could, we can do more. As someone said earlier, we, you know, we can design and construct whatever our community wants. The question is, is, is that what gets to the top? Is that, is that what the priority is? And we're, we're prepared to, to do our part to help, thanks. It sounds like it's our job to be able to make sure that those get pushed to the top for the priorities. So terrific. So Bruce, I know you've been curating the questions in the chat. Do you wanna bring a few of them to the, to the group? I do, yes. And I just wanna comment, those were excellent uh, comments and presentations, really appreciate it. You know, something that Andy said just is, is so key. He said, you know, we've, we've told the traffic engineers what we want them to do and they've done an excellent job of it over the years. But if we can convince uh, the powers that be that we can change that model, those engineers can do the right thing and do it well. And it's a matter of, as Bill said, you know, it's what, the, what does the community want, the greater community. And in an earlier presentation um, last year at an active transportation summit, um, a gentleman from, from VDOT, Mark Cole, I think, said, you know, we can control the speed on Route 1, but we need to have a larger discussion with the community about speed. And as was mentioned, you know, we're designing for 15% for of our trips uh, that are the commuting trips. So enough said. Um, Bill, unfortunately, or fortunately for you, almost all the questions <laughs> are VDOT related. And uh, we, I'll break those up a little bit, but the first one is what maintenance schedule does VDOT have in place for the shared use paths to ensure they remain debris free and in good working order? It's a huge challenge for us. We've worked with the VDOT uh, maintenance folks, and I think that's another place where the community needs to provide input. But Bill, um, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, I would welcome more input. I mean, so some of the trails, are not ours, right? Not not everything out there belongs to VDOT. Um, obviously, a lot of it does, but um, sometimes you have to look at who the actual owner is. I don't know that we have an actual schedule. It's a great question, um, but that also is indicative of maybe maybe we don't, since I don't know off the top of my head. But I'll I'll check with our maintenance team. I do know that we will respond if there, you know, we have a web page where, or you can call us, but there's a web page. I've used the web page before, I usually get pretty quick responses when I see a maintenance issue out there, uh, so something needs to happen. I know we do sweep things um, uh, at different times when request comes in. I'm not sure if we actually have a schedule for some of that, uh, but also, uh, you know, replacing, uh, pavement, you know, uh, years ago, we just a few years ago, five years ago, so we repaved the Fairfax County Parkway, a, port, a major portion of it. And I said to my boss, we, we, we should be repaving that trail too, because there's some pretty bad sections out there. And we ultimately got a, uh, some major sections redone, but I don't know that we have a schedule. In fact, I would say we do not have a schedule for repaving trails. Um, it, it's one of a, it's an issue for us for certain. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, we have advocated with the maintenance folks and we've had a good relationship with them. I think the response often is that when there's money left over, there's more money for trail maintenance. And if there's a bad uh, winter, then it sucks up some of that money. Um, we'd also like to see VDOT with a trail coordinator to kind of oversee these trails. Uh, but thank you for mentioning uh, Fairfax County Parkway Trail. We thought we advocated and got that done, but I'm really glad to hear that internally you, uh, you, oh, well, you know, we need well, to. I, we, we know it's important, Bruce. We, yeah. we, we knew we had some customers out there that that was yeah. important for. Thank you, Bill. Uh, another one related, similar. 
Um, does VDOT have the capability to do bike projects that are unrelated to roadway widening? For example, could VDOT design bicycle boulevards? Well, uh, we can design bicycle boulevards if the community would like us to, um, but we've got to identify, you know, where that would be. And we obviously haven't done that, but we've been supporting the WNOD trail, which I consider a bicycle boulevard. And I, I do look at different networks, trying to expand the network. That's why I brought up the Route 7 uh, multi-purpose trail, Route 1. I mean, we get more and more. If we can build spurs off the WNOD, we can build uh, a greater network. And I think, I think that's important. But we also have opportunities for localities to submit um, through uh, Smart Scale, HSIP, uh, maybe some other programs that I can't think of right now. The localities can submit those for funding and they're can be uh, standalone uh, projects like that, but admittedly, there's there's not a whole lot of them, but but it can be done. Yeah. I see that Andy has a question, but I, I want to jump in because I have to ask this question. I've seen um, in some cases where some of those things, including around the 66 trail, the not in my backyard, people who who for reasons that completely baffle me, don't want yeah. a bike, I, I bought a house with a bike trail in the backyard intentionally. What, yeah. What's going on there? So I wanna say, I mean, while I, I'm gonna suggest that everybody that's listening to my words right now is an advocate for this issue, there's an important component that's not here today. And that is that is people that do not support um, trails and, and uh, sidewalks. And we do experience that on a, semi-regular basis. I mean, even the Route 7 project that I've probably touted too much uh, today already, but uh, that one, uh, even down to some of our last public meetings as we were finalizing the, the design, uh, we had three speakers in a row come out and say, we don't want all these trails. Get rid of all of them or get rid of one of them and just have it on one side of the road instead of both. And so that is happening on a semi-regular basis, but I think, you know, groups like, like these are generally out and engaged, you know, pressing your points of view, and they're obviously, you're winning more and more often. Yeah, we try to attend as many of those meetings as possible and speak up because we know it does make a difference. Um, Andy. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah, I know it's not in Northern Virginia, but in the Central Virginia district, VDOT is, um, managing the um, construction of the Fall Line Trail from Ashland to Petersburg, which is, um, it, it, they're treating it as a design build project and um, are showing their efficiency and the, the rigor with which they approach projects for a standalone 43 mile trail project, which is really awesome to see. Um, I, Bill, I, I will, I have to admit, I'm super irritated with you for doing all this great work after I left and moved to Richmond. Like, my commute to work downtown would have been like 15 minutes quicker if that bridge had been there when I was using the WNOD trail and and um, the the Tyson's Bridge. All that other stuff is 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 amazing to see. And I wonder um, how the, the illustration you gave of the forms was was helpful and partly answered the question I had. But like, how is that change and that shift? Um, I mean, you've seen it over 30 plus years. Um, do your colleagues embrace and welcome that? Are there still people shuffling down the corridors, complaining bitterly that they have to, to, to do this stuff? Like it, internally, how, is, how has that change been received? And what do you think the external pressures are that have helped sort of force the pace on that? So I, I think my belief is that internally, we've got a, a lot of people that are interested and happy within VDOT that are interested and very happy to be building trails and sidewalks. I mean, as civil engineers, um, we want to build good quality projects, uh, including multimodal projects. We enjoy driving around and driving our families crazy as we point and go, hey, you know, I had something to do with that one. And look at there's somebody using it, and uh, isn't that cool? So I think we've got a lot of people. We have a bike rack outside our building here, uh, off of West Ox Road, um, and I see a bike or a couple of bikes in it every week. So I, I do think we we have uh, that happening. What was your second part of your question? I'm sorry. Um, 
what do you think has been the, the external oh, the, pressure so to, to bring the, that change back? One of the things that's important is having it up front. So a project manager will get a little stressed if, if something gets added later, because now we're talking about budgetary items. We might have already committed to a budget and now we're trying to pay for something else. Another thing is up here, as I think everyone knows, the land costs a lot of money. And uh, this is one of the challenges that we have even on that Route 7 project that's inside near Colmore that, that was referenced earlier. I mean, there's, there's no right of way to, to do something. So we're looking at where can we take out a shoulder? Where can we eke out something? Because otherwise we're into gas station properties. We're into, I'm not saying that those are the foundational project properties of our society, but that property is pretty important to whoever owns it and has that business. Um, and so we sometimes have property owners as well that are not interested in helping us resolve. And, and a lot of, a lot of the times I think some of the missing segments are there because they're the hard ones. Um, you know, there, there's a missing culvert, there's a missing, or there's a, there's a property in the way, uh, that sort of thing. Those, those things can challenge us and cause uh, stress to our, our team members. All right. Um, we really do need to wrap up. We've got a couple of other questions here that unfortunately we're not going to have time to get to. One of them is one of uh, that I was going to ask is related to enforcement. You know, we're going to reduce the speed limit on Route 1 from 45 to 35, but that's all we're doing is putting up signs and it really, ideally, you would re-engineer the road. Um, so my question is going to be what role does enforcement play? Um, but it's so hard. There's there's a limit res limited resources, but I think technology could potentially play a big role there too. Um, so I unfortunately, folks, we're going to have to wrap up. Bethany's going to pose one last question, and and we'll um, end it there. So I would I would just say you know our goal was at the end of this that we'd be moving forward in some way, right? To tame arterials and. And in some ways, we've already shown that those steps are being taken, but they're not giant steps now. So what one thing do each of you want to see to make our arterials safer for the communities they're in? And we'll, I'll, I'll actually go in the in the order in which we in which we started um, to be able to, to give you a couple, just a couple of minutes, one, one minute to be able to answer the question. Andy, do you want to go? Um, sure. I, um... <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to go with a slight, uh, maybe a slightly shocking and unofficial, not a tool design uh, comment. Um, I think we should put a moratorium on any new lanes of traffic, adding any new capacity to the system before we've fixed what we've got and we've made what we've got more bikeable, walkable, transit friendly and reinvest the money in communities that have been overlooked for decades that need the investment, meet the goals of the Justice 40 initiative of the US Department of Transportation, uh, meet, meet the, our energy and climate goals, and just not keep digging a bigger hole for ourselves. Excellent. So Supervisor Lusk. That's all. Wow, those are good. Um, I'll say, I'll be a broken record here and say use of technology to make our arterial safer too, making sure we're continuing to do that. Um, looking at the reduction of speeds, um, obviously as we make uh, the roadways um, slower, they become a bit safer. Um, Fatality is reduced dramatically as you reduce the speeds. Um, and then, you know, making sure we're engaging the community, and I mean all members of the community in discussions about future development, and then making sure they understand the impacts as it relates to uh, pedestrian, uh, bicycle, and other um, uh, improvements. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So, Bill? I, uh, yeah, I, I think I'd like to see a, a focus in some of the areas that um, are not the beneficiaries of large scale projects, right? Because that's kind of what I showed a lot of you. I'm certainly proud of the work that we do in that. But uh, a lot of times those are in areas that, except for a few, they're in areas that are growing and have lots of uh, you know, wealthier folks and so on. And so it, I think it, it's appropriate to 
and take a look at some of the corridors that are quote unquote left behind and you know why has it been so many decades and why don't we bring a, a, a more clear focus onto some of those areas yeah, and uh leading this i definitely i've challenged my team to the pedestrian project i was talking about the 22 million dollars and looking at 400 intersections i've challenged them to finish the project early or the goal and deadline is 2025, but we're trying to finish that early and then we can use our resources to then tackle our next project and our next program and start looking at mid block locations next. Excellent, excellent. And Stuart. First, I'm gonna strongly second what Andy said. We don't have time to waste. We may need to make a paradigm shift right now. Uh, we need to address climate change. We need to create these mixed use walkable communities as a priority. And I'll give two quick examples of things we could do. We could adopt different design standards, whether it's NACTO or whomever's, for better arterials. And we can take advantage of federal flexibility and surface transportation and national highway system funding and flex that 50% we're allowed to flex to these types of projects. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you all. I, I we, we know we've got a ton of questions that continue to come in and hopefully everybody's looking at them and listening to them, thinking about what our next steps are. It sounds like we need to have more of these conversations. Um, on behalf of the Fairfax Alliance for Better Biking, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and thank specifically our, our guests, our panelists tonight. So um, can everybody join me in giving some virtual kind of round of applause for, for, um, for all of our guests? Thank you all. Thanks for joining us tonight and um, and continue to pay attention to the Fairfax Alliance for Better Biking, um, our website, join us at our events. Um, and Bruce, is there anything else you want to add? No, I just want to thank the speakers. It was an excellent session. Appreciate the, them and all the, the questions. Um, so yeah, thanks again. Yeah, thanks for everybody's active participation. Have a good night.